It's like 3 a.m. in the morning, so I figured, what the hell, I might as well shoot the video report because I've got nothing better to do. I just got finished watching a couple of hours ago the New Orleans Pelicans delivering a top-rated 15-dime best bet winner for me as they went out right at Portland once more. And, of course, in yesterday's video report, a 2-0 sweep as I cashed in not only with my two-team teaser as I gave you Toronto and New Orleans, but also a baseball winner on the Arizona Diamondbacks. So I'm on an 11-2 run with my complimentary plays here on the video report over the past nine days. And I've got a free selection coming up on Game 2 of the Oklahoma City Utah Jazz series in just a moment. But again, since I figured it's 3 a.m., my wife is out of town for the week, and I've got nothing better to do. Before I get to that free selection, let me uh, give you a little story here. And uh, it's eventually going to get around to the passing of Hal Greer, an NBA Hall of Famer who passed away a couple of days ago. Um, I told you in the past that I went to Temple University a couple of hundred years ago, and I went there uh, because at the time when I graduated high school, that was the place to go on the East Coast if you wanted to have a career and break into the industry of TV and radio. And I had aspired to either be a TV reporter and or a sports talk radio host. And at that time, it was a different era. There was no 24-hour uh, sports talk radio networks as there is nowadays. Uh, it was a different world in the media. So I went to Temple, and I went there for two reasons. One, because again, it was the reputation for Temple University because they had a lot of adjunct professors that worked in the TV radio business that you were actually getting uh, taught by and also because they had a great internship program. So I go to Temple, and they had a phenomenal radio station, and it was a two-pronged type of radio station. One, uh, it was on the FM dial, and it was an all-jazz station, and it was not the type of jazz station that was playing like Spyro Gyra and Pat Metheny and Earl Clue and soft jazz, beautiful jazz music. No, this was like a real jazz station. You know, uh, Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, uh, John Coltrane, Selected vocals by Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald. New jazz music by like uh, Herbie Hancock at the time. You know, real jazz, okay? But it also had a top-notch news department and sports department. And, of course, that was my avenue to explore. And um, I can tell you that in the three years that I was involved with the radio station, easily 25 to 30 of us um, went on to work in major markets and TV and radio. That's how talented of a group that uh, of students uh, that was populating that radio station at the time. And for me on the sports side, not only did I get to cut my teeth doing play-by-play -play in football and basketball, but we also had, which what I would say is the precursor to what you now call the summer league for basketball that they have out in Las Vegas primarily, we had the Sunny Hill League, the Baker League, I mean, we're, you know, I got to spend the entire summer doing play-by-play -play for basketball for top college athletes and pros who just wanted to drop in and play pickup games in North Philadelphia for summer basketball that I get to broadcast live. And it was basically if I wanted to show up at the game, hey, I could do play-by-play. I mean, you talk about cutting your teeth and learning how to be a play-by-play -play announcer. But anyway, they also had a sports talk show. So, yeah, the audition for it, and hey, listen, you know, there was only one sports talk show and a chance to host a show, one person a year, and I got the opportunity, and I won that position. So, you know, it was like a kid being given the keys to a candy store, because once you got that job, you were also able then to basically cherry pick whoever you wanted to have as a guest. And again, we're on the FM dial, and this was the beginning in the 80s where you had cable television often would simulcast radio stations on cable channels. And because we were really the only pure jazz station anywhere in the area, our signal was broadcast the entire state of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and Delaware. So we had a massive audience. So when I'd go on the air, I'd have this huge audience. The callers would call in like crazy. So I realized it was easy 
there was all to get guests. And there was only like two other mainstream talk shows in Philadelphia that was on two, three hours and they competed with each other. So my little niche, it was easy to get guests. Boxing, football, anything I wanted to. So Mr. Greer, Hal Greer, a former Philadelphia 76ers and Philadelphia Warriors great, was elected to the NBA Hall of Fame, 1982. He was coaching, I think, for a team in the Continental Basketball Association. So I thought, hey, you know, I was not around to watch him play. He was playing in NBA All-Star games before I was born. But being elected to the NBA Hall of Fame, I thought, I've got to have him on as a guest. So he was very gracious, came on the show. And this is where the kid in the candy store comes in. I got to talk to this man and ask him what it was like to play with Wilt. To play with Wilt Chamberlain when Wilt Chamberlain was the man in the NBA. Talking to him when he was playing with Wilt Chamberlain on that 1966-1967 Philadelphia 76ers team that many thought still to this day, may have been the best team ever in the NBA. Now, others will say the record with the 72 uh, Lakers is better, and of course, Michael Jordan's Bulls teams may have been better, but that 66-67 Philadelphia 76ers team was pretty damn good. And of course, in 1996, the 50th anniversary NBA team, Hal Greer was among those 50 players elected by the NBA for the 50th anniversary team. That's how good this guy was. So to have this man on, he spent like a half hour with me, a teenager, just half hour, just shooting the bull with me, spending the time, taking calls from callers who, of course, you know, nobody else was having Hal Greer, I think, on. You know, the the phone boards just lit up. Gracious man, nice man, passed away the other day. But that was the best part I could say about college. That experience you know, eventually then graduating, uh, not graduating, but moving on then and then covering the 76ers. Uh, for my first year, uh, let's see, yes, my first year out of school, covering the 76ers, going into the locker rooms, going in. And at that time, before the internet, before Twitter, before Facebook, before social media, you know, now you have to go to games and you have to do all this pregame work. Back in those days, the game was at 7 o'clock. You'd go down, like at the Spectrum in Philadelphia, so you'd get there at like 5.30, right? And this is how it used to be. You'd get there at 5.30. You'd go into uh, one of the auxiliary rooms next to the locker room, right? You'd sit there with all the other writers. There'd be a beer. There'd be soda. There'd be food. There'd be a buffet. That's why all the writers were there. It was free food. And you'd sit there, and you just talk. You'd shoot the you-know-what because there was nothing else to do. There was no... You didn't have to tweet. You didn't have to file your Instagram reports. You didn't have to do anything, right? You'd sit there. So there I am, like 20 years old, sitting there with Jim Murray, the LA Times, sitting there with all these great writers who I used to read when I was 13 from getting the sporting news and going, oh my God, I used to read these guys. Listening to these guys talk basketball. talk. I mean, it was like, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica of NBA greats talking and I'm... I was afraid to talk. (laughs) You know, I'm sitting there going, I'm learning from these men. That, I don't get too excited about doing these video reports, okay? That was the mecca as far as I was concerned, being a reporter. The initial years, that was everything. I learned more about sports, more about reporting, more about the history of basketball baseball and football, listening to these guys who had been around, some of them since the 50s, most of them since the 60s, covering the legends who I'd only heard about, I'd only seen on TV. An amazing thing. I I can only tell you, if you're a sports fan, if you could have been in my shoes, you would have loved it. It was an amazing, amazing time in my life. Okay, anyway, like I said, it's now... 3.15 3.15 in the morning, so let me move forward. By the way, the guy with the big play today, Shawn Michaels, each of the last five days, he's hit his major release. Last night, it was a 109 max wager on uh, New Orleans. The night before, or day before, it was Golden State. Today, another 109 max wager release. It is on the Indiana-Cleveland game. You can get it for over half price off by using the coupon code HOOPS. I don't know who the other promos are, because nobody else has anything up at 3 a.m. in the morning, but you can check out the homepage and figure it out yourself. Uh, Let me talk about the Oklahoma uh, City-Utah Jazz game. Very interesting 
how game number one in this series played out because Paul George obviously just had an incredible game. Um, a guy who totally eclipsed his regular season numbers because there's a guy who averaged about 22 points in the regular season hitting eight three-pointers, averaged about four in the regular season, uh, hit 13 to 20 shots, 36 points in game number one. 22 points in the regular season. Obviously, Russell Westbrook did not have a great shooting night, but he still was a volume scorer. But the offensive burden was not all on his shoulders. And that's what he's needed the last couple of years in the postseason, right? Since Kevin Durant left, that's what he needed. And Paul George put on the Superman cape and delivered. Now, Paul George did suffer a hip contusion in the game. And Corey Brewer is nursing a sprained knee. But they are both expected to play here tonight. But I think the most important part in that game was the fact that the Thunder were so deadly from three-point range. 14 for 29 on three-pointers in that game. What that did is that it really neutralized the Utah defense because their bread and butter is Rudy Gobert defending against the basket, but they were able to draw the Jazz defenders out. They couldn't play close to the basket. They couldn't clog the lane. They had to extend their defense out to defend the perimeter. Well, that does two things. One, you're drawing that defense out. Thunder are hitting the three-pointers. That also opens up the lane, which makes Westbrook all the more dangerous when he wants to drive and then dish if he wants to, kicking the ball back out to the perimeter. It left the Jazz vulnerable defensively. When you think about how the Jazz opened up that game and took a 16-4 lead, and then they were down by 18 points in the second half. That's how dominant the Thunder were once they got their offense cranking. And here's the irony. The Thunder were 23rd in the league in three-point shooting. And yet they were deadly in game number one. The Thunder also were a lousy free-throw shooting team this season. Next to last in the league in free-throw shooting percentage. Yet they hit 20 of 23 from the free-throw line in game number one. What I think is most worrisome, if you're a uh, Utah Jazz fan, is that Donovan Mitchell, he said he only stubbed his toe, but if you watched how hampered he was in the fourth quarter of that game, he left, he came back in, he was obviously in pain, his mobility was limited, they took him back, back out because the game was out of reach at that point. Yesterday, limited practice, questionable officially, but you know he's going to go and play tonight. How close is he going to be to 100%? At 50%, that's not good enough. I don't know if 75% is good enough. They need Donovan Mitchell. They need the guy who had a team high 27 points on 11 for 22 shooting in that opener with 10 rebounds. Because without him at peak efficiency, the Jazz have absolutely no chance in this game. That's the issue here tonight. That's why I look at this price at minus four points, and I know the Thunder have been so inconsistent this season. I think there's no other way to play it other than laying the points with Oklahoma City in this contest. And that's why I like Oklahoma City coming off the 116-108 to 108 win in the opener to go ahead and cover this game once more here tonight at what I think is a very cheap price considering Russell Westbrook did not have that big of a monster offensive game in the opener. And I think that Steven Adams did a very good job defensively and contributed a nice 12 points, 7 rebound, 3 assist a game offensively as well to round out the scoring. And Carmelo Anthony did a nice job off the bench. Again, I've got to go with the Thunder here as your complimentary play. Once again, Oklahoma City is going to be your freebie. That'll do it. I wish you well. I'll talk to you again on Thursday. Good luck, everybody.